This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here with uh, uh, Greg Clark, who is a uh, professor of economics at uh, University of California at Davis, and also the author of uh, these two books. Um, one is called uh, Farewell to Alms, uh, A Brief Economic History of the World, and the more recent book is The Sun Also Rises, right, pun there, uh, Surnames and the History of Social Mobility. Uh, now, Greg, I think the first time I uh, heard of you was back in 1987 when uh, you published an article called Why Isn't the Whole World Developed? Lessons from the, the Cotton Mills. And, and this, this article really kind of blindsided me because, um, you know, I was in econo studying economic history at the time, just started and, you know, had a, a very um, institutional view of things. And um, when I read this article, it, it, it basically made the claim that there is this kind of dark matter, I guess you could call it, <laughs> which is that, you know, every possible explanation for why uh, development is uneven around the world and, and why there is this divergence between the industrialized countries and the less industrialized countries, you know, every possible explanation that economic historians had come up with hitherto were, were incomplete and that this meant there was a big mystery. And I think you've probably spent the last 35 years trying to uh, disentangle uh, the, this mystery. So, so I was wondering if we could kind of back up, go back to those times when, when you first made this, this observation and, and sort of how did you come to this observation? Uh, you know, what were your thoughts and, and um, you know, where have they taken you so far? Yeah, uh, uh, my history in the economic history profession is actually as someone who came into the subject because I liked the idea that everyone's the same everywhere except for the incentives that they face are different, but who then encountered case after case where this doesn't work <laughs> as an explanation. And so in some sense, I've gone from extreme institutionalism uh, to a view which actually emphasizes much more kind of even biological inheritance as playing a significant role in outcomes over time. Uh, and, and so, yeah, it's apostasy from the economic history profession. Uh, and the way this um, article happened was um, really just being realizing that you could measure the productivity of this industry internationally, that it's incredibly standardized. This is and, the textile industry. Yeah, the textile industry, I should say, yeah. And then saying, well, you know, why does India succeed? Britain had created a free trade area with India, a country which had one-fifth the level of wages of Britain in the 19th century. Uh, and yet it never faced really serious competition from the Indian textile industry. And as you went through factor after factor, <laughs> you realized that the, the mystery is that the institutional environment was actually relatively fine. The puzzle was what was happening inside the mills. But to be honest with you, I still don't figure out what that puzzle is, <laughs> right? And we, we did a follow-up article, uh, I think, called Why Nations Fail, which actually did much more detailed study inside these Indian mills. And it's just very clear that the workers did only about a quarter of the amount of work of British workers in the same time. Um, but it is absolutely mysterious uh, how that was possible and why the employers couldn't break that if it was just an equilibrium, where the workers are basically saying, well, you don't pay us very much, so no, we're not going to deliver very much. It's perfectly easy for the employers to kind of to break that equilibrium. And so that was actually uh, still an incredible uh, puzzle. And in the end, I, effectively, I just had to walk away from that because I couldn't see any path really to resolving that puzzle, right? Because one of the elements of that puzzle is that you can find these very low productivity societies, but then find that a generation later or 50 years later, they no longer are low productivity societies. And so that you could see this transformation occurring, 
And that again suggests, well, this must just be some kind of convention that's happening here. But in that case, institutionally, employers should be able to break the convention. And so, for example, in India, the center of the industry was places like Bombay. Wages were relatively high in Indian standards in Bombay. New mills were being set up in low-wage areas in the countryside. If it really was just a function of, you know, the workers just have agreed, this is what we do. Then when you set up the new mill, you don't hire any workers from Bombay. You start afresh and you tell them, no, no, you do four times as much. <laughs> and then you start from there. But what you actually observed in India in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, is that the lower were the wages in a mill sector, the lower was worker productivity. <laughs> and the new centers just couldn't break the equilibrium that the, the old centers had. And so, as I say, it's, 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 it's actually one of the stunning mysteries still uh, of uh, kind of uh, world history is just how important uh, these differences in outcomes are. And, and recently it's in the news because there's um, one of my colleagues now is from Argentina. And, you know, you had Italians going from Italy to northeastern United States or going from Italy to Argentina. And you end up with these very different outcomes for those migrants. And again, the, the puzzle is, uh, how do you get these kind of, uh, low output, low equilibrium level equilibrium societies developing and, and what breaks that uh, equilibrium. And so as I say, I'm still fascinated by that, but. After doing this study that even went, looked at the very details of the inside of Indian factories, we realized, well, that there was just nothing more we could do in terms of this topic. Well, I think economists have uh, a difficult time explaining um, variations in performance uh, across uh, regions. They also have a difficult time explaining variations in performance kind of uh, over time. And um, you, you mentioned this sort of um, dogma of of economics, right? That, um, you know, only incentives matter. And I just wanted to quote, when I read this, I was like, only an economist could be this harsh, uh, against uh, economists. And, and you said, um, there's a couple quotes like this in, in the book, but one of them was, I'll just quote from the book, the popular misconception of the pre-industrial world is of a cowering mass of peasants ruled by a small, violent and stupid upper class that extracted from them all surplus beyond what was needed for subsistence. And so gave no incentives for trade investment or improvement in technology. These exclusive and moronic ruling classes were aided in their suppression of all enterprise and innovation by organized religions of stultifying orthodoxy, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and I think then you say that, you know, only the only people who could come up with this are, are dogmatic, uh, economists and their priestly caste. Uh, and, and you say that, you know, economists don't have a good understanding of of history, but, you know, economists are all about kind of equilibrium and, and, you know, the, the problem is how do you go from one equilibrium to another, you know, you need some kind of comet that comes from outer space. Right. So, so what are some of the, the, the views of economists of how the industrial revolution got started, right? You mentioned uh, a couple, you can your, your, your kind of classification of these theories in the book is a little right. bit different from the, um, the ones that I'm yeah, familiar so, with. So in terms of, uh, classifying the great mysteries of economic history. As I say, the, the mystery of the 19th and 20th century are the stunning differences in efficiency and productivity between different societies, which really emerged after the industrial revolution and really, and are still a kind of the stunning feature of the modern world. In the earlier period, the incredible mystery is why the industrial revolution took so long and why it occurred in a tiny island off the coast of Europe <laughs> and not in China, for example. And as I say, again, uh, the, uh, in, in terms of the industrial revolution, uh, people will trot out all of the kind of standard institutional arguments, but mostly these are economists who are actually not that familiar with the institutions of medieval England of early modern England and then of 19th century England. And that's the big protection <laughs> that allows you to still kind of easily quote these kind of institutional arguments. 
because what is amazing actually about British society in the period of the Industrial Revolution is how little and how slowly the institutions were changing. I think you also mentioned that if it really is the kind of if, very, if the if the World Bank and the, and the IMF were to draw up an ideal society for economic development, it would be you know medieval England. I think you <laughs> you said that. Yes, yes. So in the book, in the book, I do this kind of checklist. And so, you know, what do economists believe? They believe in low taxes. Yeah, check medieval England. There's like a one percent national tax at maximum. Uh, they believe, you know, people should have all kinds of incentives. And yeah, you know, if you don't work, you're going to starve in medieval England. Uh, they believe, uh, you know, property rights uh, and, and protection of the individual. Well, we actually know the murder rates in medieval England. They weren't insignificant, though, of course, they didn't have effective medical treatment. So any kind of stab wound could be your end. But they're still significantly lower than, say, the murder rates in the modern-day Caribbean or in Central America now. These, it was actually a significantly safer society. Um, and, you know, property rights, we can actually see plots of land that transferred legitimately from owner to owner over the course of 300 years. And that's absolutely typical. Uh, and, you know, so, so it, it turns out that, yes, it's a highly incentivized society. Um, for example, serf labor just disappeared in medieval England, right? I mean, it, it, there was no abolition movement, <laughs> but, but effectively this serf society in 1100 was a free labor society by 1300. Uh, and so as I say, so again, confronting this, uh, what you said, you know, what you're thinking is that, look, it, it's, it's not really going to be institutional changes. These are too slow in Britain. And already, you know, you could pick out 1300, 1500, 1600, they would all be perfectly good candidates for an industrial revolution. Um, a second thing that people have brought attention to are advances in literacy and in scientific, uh, knowledge. But again, these are very incremental developments, right? So literacy rates were moving up in Britain <clears throat> over the course of the 18th and 19th century, but going up by like one or 2% per decade. And England actually is way behind Northern Europe in terms of literacy. Uh, and, and then the other thing is there's very, very little connection between the formal universities and science of the era and the people who are creating the industrial revolution. It's actually kind of artisans, uh, traders, others who are actually making, uh, a lot of these breakthroughs. Um, and so again, uh, you know, but, but if you go to England in 1740, it's a society with effectively almost no technological advance. If you go there by 1780 or 1800, it's on the move. <laughs> uh, and something uh, dramatic has changed. And so a problem there in kind of any explanation of the Industrial Revolution is that the underlying conditions of the society are changing very slowly, but the Industrial Revolution appears as this relatively discontinuous kind of break in the past. And actually, in the last six months, I've actually come up with another theory of the Industrial Revolution, which if you want later, I could share, uh, which is actually connected with the later the book on social mobility. Uh, and so maybe we, if we come and talk about that, uh, I have another idea about how we might uh, explain this breakthrough. Well, we should definitely talk about that. But um, I, I think, you know, the, the, when I was in, in school, the, the dragon that needed to be slain was the uh, kind of big push school, right? Where, uh, it, you know, you needed this somehow manufacture an increase in, in kind of capital investment in order to jumpstart the industrial revolution. And, and I think it, it's when people realized that there was no such big, you know, capital push that coincided with that discontinuity that people shifted to this more institutional explanation because then folks like Doug North could say, oh, well, you know, glorious revolution, right? <laughs> or uh, statute of Anne or something like this, right? Which, which seemed to line up temporally. Um, and, and so what's, what's wrong with, with that explanation that, um, you know, it was really in the 18th century when innovators were able to finally capture the, the value of their, their innovations and inventors could, you know, all of a sudden 
start getting rich off uh, of new technologies and, and new processes and new forms of organization. Well, one thing that is pointed out in the book is that uh, the very interesting thing about the Industrial Revolution in Britain was that the rewards to the innovators were actually very modest. And, and that shows up in the form that when America industrialized in the late 19th century, there were enormous rewards. And now we have all these foundations and universities that were the product of this. There are effectively no private universities in Britain, and there are almost no great foundations because this was a very competitive form of industrialization. And one product of that was that, you know, people patented stuff, but people copied it. Ideas leaked out. People reverse engineered things. Um, now, there has been a recent study where someone's actually systematically gone through and looked at the rewards of innovation by comparing men with their brothers, where one of them's an innovator and the other just had a more conventional career. And they find that the innovators actually do make more than their brothers did. And so that there wasn't a complete absence of rewards. But it, it's certainly not enormous, the rewards that people were being given. And, and the British patent system, the property rights protections, are very imperfect in that society. And, uh, you know, and again, as I say, history tends to get compressed. So when we look back, we see glorious revolution, you know, 1689, industrial revolution, 1780, that seems reasonable that that could explain that, right? But this, in some sense, is the equivalent of saying Ronald Reagan finally had an effect in 2070, you know, in terms of the policies that they adopted in the U.S. And so the problem is, as I say, that the, the Glorious Revolution itself produced no discernible change in the performance of British society. And almost everyone who was alive at the time of the Glorious Revolution was dead before there was any inkling of the industrial revolution. And so, as I say again, uh, the problem is just the incremental nature of changes in that society. I mean, if you go to France or something like the French Revolution, then you see dramatic changes, right? If you look at China's history, you see these dramatic changes. But the, the amazing thing about Britain is that it's probably one of the best documented historical records of any society over the last 600 years. But that, ha but that occurred in part because nothing ever happened in England. <laughs> Everything changed very slowly. Uh, when they had a revolution like the Glorious Revolution, they basically agreed that the current king would run away and then this, you know, his daughter would then take over. Um, and, and so, as I say, the more you know about British history, the, the, the more you understand this kind of very incrementalist nature of change. And then, as I say, in this setting, this dramatic world-changing event <laughs> occurring. And I confess that I tend to wake up very early in the morning. I'm not a good sleeper. And some mornings I still actually wake up and think, what did cause the Industrial Revolution? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and 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 I I think it is one of the most amazing uh, mysteries of human history, and because and and what's amazing about this also is that you know if we're talking about things like quantum mechanics, most of us can agree that we'll never understand quantum mechanics, but for the industrial revolution, most people can understand. Well, here's the elements, of the puzzle. <laughs> here's the things that went in. Uh, how could there not be? relatively simple explanation of, uh, no what, comet. what happens. <laughs> there was no comet that came from outer space. Well, you know, I, I, I tried to answer this question and, and I was, you know, I spent 14 years in a PhD program in history before I finally gave up. Uh, but you know, I found that you had to keep kind of going back further and further in time. And I ultimately gave up by the time I got to Henry the second, but, um, but I think you're arguing that even though there's no radical discontinuity, um, between say the 14th century and the 18th century in, in England, in terms of the, the, you know, adaptations, uh, England was in, in many ways different from a typical Malthusian society. Right. And, you know, you, you look at forager groups and, and other, um, societies, you look at, you know, China and, and, and India and other, um, you know, 
uh, agricultural societies. And, and there was something different about England. You mentioned kind of rates of violence being relatively low. What, what were sort of the, the things that may have created this kind of pre-adaptive uh, environment? Well, uh, another feature of English history is that between even 1300 and 1800, it was a static society in terms of living standards, life expectancy. A lot of the institutions are not changing that much. But there was significant change occurring economically. And the most dramatic of these changes is that the prevailing interest rate on the most safe loans in medieval England was 10%, real return that you could get. Now, hedge funds now would go wild if they could guarantee without risk a 10% real return. That was available to every person in medieval England. And you could buy land in half acre lots. Uh, and, and, you know, a half acre would only cost something like two weeks wages for someone. And so everyone in medieval England had access to transforming their economic condition in the course of their lifetime. It's a, a land of fantastic economic opportunities. And we actually know in these villages that people are, peasants are able to accumulate hundreds of acres of land. That prevailing rate of return had dropped to between four and 5% by 1800. And so it's again, a great kind of, and, and it turns out that's just part of a general puzzle in the pre-industrial world where the further back you go, typically the higher are rates of return, the safe rates of return on capital. And if we go back to ancient Babylonia, we're up at 20 to 30% is the return. And that, as I say, is again, it's a great puzzle in economic terms because that rate of return seems to depend just on psychology right? Or it's default risk, right? But as I say, we, in this case, we can rule out the default risk. And so somehow people were thinking very differently about the world. And then the second change that's very interesting is the decline but by thinking in the underlying you, violence. By, yeah. By, by thinking right. differently, you mean that people's kind of rate of time preference has changed? Um, yes. you, you mentioned that in, in like forager societies, um, you know, you're, you're talking about 30% daily kind of rate of time preference, right? I mean, yeah, really, really high. Yes. No, no. I, and uh, so basically, yes, somehow people's psychology had changed. Uh, and as I say, we, we also find this uh, with respect to uh, uh, violence, right? That people's taste for violence had somehow been declining. And then another feature of the pre-industrial world uh, is that over the long run, people seem to actually start working much more. And we can actually observe very good records uh, of England around about 1800. And one of them actually comes from the criminal courts where witnesses describe what they were doing at the time they saw the crime or they heard the window break or whatever. <laughs> and from these time diaries, you could actually observe how much time people are spending at work. And people are working about 10 hours a day uh, six days a week in this world. And that's a very high rate of labor input compared to hunter-gatherer societies. And so again, it's a puzzle about, well, why do people work so much, right? And one of the amazing mysteries of the modern world is that people are still, once you count things like commuting time or home, food preparation, other things like that, they still spend compared to most creatures in the animal kingdom, a surprisingly high amount of time at work. Uh, and in some sense, we seem to have become addicted to work. And so again, it's kind of a, the, these puzzling uh, developments. And then another feature in British society that was interesting was the spread of kind of almost, you know, you know close to universal literacy by the late 19th century. Uh, and only 1% of people could read or write in the medieval period. But somehow people were acquiring literacy. And one of the things that's amazing here is by 1800, 40 or 45% of women are literate. And this is not something that they, they use for work. Uh, it's uh, just an accomplishment that for some reason people care about. And it turns out we have very good marriage records from early 19th century England. If a, a literate woman will marry a higher status husband, 
right? And so people care about this, but you know, again, the question is, it had no economic effect for most people, literacy. Well, that's why some, yeah. some people would argue that this was the, the exogenous shock was a, you know, based on ideas. So, you know, Protestantism right. came in and, and this, you know, got people to work harder and, you know, value literacy so they could read, read the Bible. So, so this was sort of the comet that, that came out of, uh, outer space. Um, again, the, the, you, you're going to have problems with, uh, timing and location, right? So Britain, of course, the incrementalist society, it never really fully embraced Protestantism. <laughs> it adopted a very British compromise uh, that left a kind of quasi-Catholic church, you know, in place in England, where uh, uh, if, so if you think that Protestantism is really the driving force, then where you would need to go is Germany, the Netherlands, Scotland, these are the societies that really embraced Protestantism, but they're not the places where the industrial revolution occurred. Right. And, and so I agree that it, it's a very interesting ideological change. You, in my own country, Scotland, it, it had almost a hundred percent literacy by 1800. And it also had much better universities than England had. Uh, again, under this kind of educational uh, impulse. Uh, but I, again, the, the, there is just the, this problem of timing. I mean, Protestantism is early 16th century, and you want to then use that to explain an event <laughs> that occurred more than 200 years later, uh, and where it's very hard geographically to kind of draw that link between Protestantism and then later uh, technological advance. And so what the, the big innovation then of my first book was to embrace the idea that, look, in the Malthusian world that preceded the industrial revolution, there was a force that was actually driving societies. And that was that each parent could have only two children on average who survived, but which children survived is very much being driven by the economic system. And that there's very clear evidence in England in this period, and now in a bunch of other countries like China, uh, Germany, uh, Scandinavia, that those who succeeded economically were those who were populating these societies. And those who failed economically were those whose children no longer were around in these societies. And I'm very strong, I'm still very convinced that this is a very important element and that, you know, one thing we're expected to believe now is that if you look at a modern farmyard, all of the animals there have been completely modified by man, except the farmer. <laughs> the farmer is the only truly wild creature in the farmyard. But I think the, the more interesting, uh, aspect is that we have adapted to capitalism and we've actually adapted biologically to capitalism. And that is going to be part of the, any story about the delay in the industrial revolution and also kind of the location of the industrial revolution. And that, that, you know, in, in the centuries that preceded them, but thousands of years of settled agrarian society there was some kind of interplay going on between human nature and capitalism. And that that's actually left us now also a legacy, which affects what happens to people in modern economic competition. Right. And so an example of give that is that, you know, uh, Chinese have one of the longest histories of market society of any society in the world. It's very interesting that when Chinese laborers were shipped to places like the Philippines, Malaysia, various other societies like that, they ended up becoming the entrepreneurial class of those societies without any inherent advantage politically or in terms of capital. Uh, and it really seems that somehow the long history of the societies is actually uh, playing a role in modern competition as discomforting as that 
actually is, right? Because we really would like to think that there's, that history doesn't matter, right? That every group of people is born completely anew in every generation. Uh, but yes, I think, uh, and so one of the things in that I was able myself to do was to show this process of survival of the richest and to document very clearly that that was a very powerful force in, uh, English society. Uh, and that is something that can easily change things like time preference, right? Because time preference varies across individuals. And if people with lower time preference do better economically, produce more children, then that'll change quickly at a social level. Now, of course, this idea of survival of the, the richest, I mean, this is not unique to capitalist societies, right? I mean, you know, the, even in, in, you know, primate societies, if you can marshal you know, more resources, then you're going to have a reproductive ad advantage. Um, so, you know, wouldn't this be true in, in, in every society or is, is there something unique about the, the way you assemble resources in these market economies? Well, I think the, uh, unfortunately we, we don't get a lot of evidence for this for say hunter gatherer or, or shifting cultivation societies, but we, we do know from that kind of limited evidence that, that often men who are rewarded with reproductive success are those who engage in warfare, in raiding and in, in violence in those societies. And what's interesting in English history is we do have some records of those who engaged in this kind of violence and it wasn't a successful reproductive strategy. The people who were succeeding in Britain were the shopkeepers. It really is true that Britain is a nation of shopkeepers <laughs> because the people who engaged in political intrigue at the top of the society and also in warfare tended to actually have relatively low reproductive success because so many of them died uh, before they could actually get around to reproducing. And so I think, uh, the idea here is that, um, societies, it, and, and this actually is showing that there's an interesting interplay between institutions and outcomes, but in a very different long run way that by adopting a set of institutions that limited violence and limited the exercise of violence in a society you actually set up a different reproductive competition between people and one that can potentially then change the types of people who are actually, uh, uh, engaging in that society. And so, so in some sense, even though I'm saying the book is saying, look, it's a, it's a mistake to overemphasize institutions. What it's actually saying is that institutions actually may play a significant role, but in very different ways than we expect. Right. That it doesn't change overnight. It changes after 500 years. So does it get back to, I think, I think it was Doug North who said, you know, I threw up his hands at one point and said that, you know, England is different because it's an island. Right. And so, you know, they didn't have a whole lot of warfare. I mean, because I think in say the 30 years war, you know, your, your, your likelihood of dying as a civilian is probably not that much lower than your probability of dying as, as a soldier. Whereas in, in, in Britain, I guess if you're a soldier, your, your probability of dying is significantly higher than as a civilian, simply because the, the, the war, if it was happening was over in, you know, Flanders or someplace. Is that, yeah. is that yeah, part no, of the story? You can, actually, you can see that in British society, that deaths, uh, you know, collateral damage from warfare all the way from 1300 to 1800 in Britain was, was minimal. And it actually shows up in the English civil war. Uh, you can look at things like what's the rate of return on land purchases, right? And you'd expect, hey, if there's chaos here, then rates of return will have to go up to compensate. They hardly even, you would not notice it in the land price series that they were having a civil war. And so the, there were soldiers dying, but civilian casualties seem to have been quite limited. And so that, in some sense, uh, 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 it's still an unresolved issue. What's this process? of kind of survival of the richest somehow faster in English society than it was in other European societies. And, uh, I honestly, uh, I, I don't think we have the data to say whether that's the case, right? Uh, I have seen the data for China and it actually does suggest that somehow the British experience of this process was more dramatic than in Chinese society. 
So you're saying the reproductive skew for males was, was more, was, was bigger in England than in in these other societies. Yeah. It's very strong in England. Um, and, uh, yeah. So whereas in China it's there, but it's not, it's not quite as dramatic as it is with the British evidence, but it's, it's clearly there. And Japan, again, it's there, but, but much weaker. Right. Uh, and, and, and I say, I, I, it's still a little mysterious exactly why this reproductive skew existed uh, because poor people and rich people both got married, but somehow in pre-industrial British society, rich families produced more children, right? They, well, I think they, you point to child mortality. Where, was there a big gap in, in infant no, mortality I, rates? I was surprised to discover that it's mainly not a story about mortality. It's mainly a story about fertility, that richer people... Uh, just produce more uh, children. Uh, I, I have actually a, a big data set that I've been working on for, for my new book that's be, will be coming out hopefully not too far in the future. And uh, I'd actually maybe like to return to that because, you know, we have a, a lot of this uh, evidence to see, uh, you, you know, because it turns out in, in this society, if you have two brothers and one of them goes to college and the other one doesn't. The one who goes to college lives about three to five years longer. <laughs> and so it hadn't occurred to me before. I wonder if you could check, do they produce more children, the ones who are educationally successful in this period? Um, and, you know, it's, is there, you know, but, but it, it's, all I can say is from 1500 till about 1780, there's very, very good evidence from people's wills that richer people leave many more surviving children than poor people and, and that the richest people are leaving about four surviving children. So they're doubling their share in the population in every generation effectively. Uh, and that poor people have lower reproductive success. And so I think you're, you're saying that today, if, if you're English, um, regardless of whether you're rich or poor, you're, you're more likely to be descended from a a, a rich person <laughs> uh, from the 12th century than, than a poor person in, in the 12th century, right? right. And so right. The, the, okay. Yeah, and, and so the idea of the book in some sense was, look, the Industrial Revolution was created by craftsmen and the kind of the, the lower middle class, right? But the interesting argument is that, well, that group is basically, those are the descendants of what was the elite in earlier British society. And so you had this kind of democratization <laughs> of kind of this type of elite entrepreneurship and other behaviors through this demographic uh, process. Uh, whereas in, in other societies, you, you could have potentially going the other way where, you know, the poorest people are the ones who end up uh, populating uh, most of the society. Um, and so, so uh, now I should say, I, I, I'm, I'm completely convinced that this played a significant role in transforming the world, but I have to admit it's still, it's saying over time, an industrial revolution is becoming more and more likely. We don't know the, but the problem is it still yeah. doesn't predict a sudden and dramatic in the industrial revolution or anything about the timing of that industrial revolution. And so it's still a mystery as to the exact location of this industrial revolution. But what it could say is that, look, it wasn't going to happen, you know, a thousand AD, this wasn't the kind of society where it could take grip of, but, but the problem is it's, it's still very hard to explain the very sudden kind of dramatic nature of that uh, transformation. Now, that, I think that window, uh, with the wealthier having more offspring has, you know, it's flipped, right? So, you know, um, in the future, more people a thousand years from now will be descended from today's poor people, perhaps than today's rich people. Uh, and this, this speaks to, um, you know, mobility, social mobility, kind of upward and, and downward. And your other book is really all about, uh, mobility. And, and I think the, 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 the most interesting finding, uh, is that mobility is at, at once, um, lower than a lot of people think. Um, but it, it's also, you know, fairly high. Um, could, could you, what, what drew you to this? I see this sort of as a, as a logical next step from some of the content of, of the earlier book. Uh, but I'm, I'm wondering what drew you to this, 
idea of tracking social mobility. And then also, um, you know, why did you use the, the data sets that you used? And um, when did you have that kind of aha moment that the way in which we were tracking um, social mobility was, was incorrect? It's, I, I hate to admit how slow and how stupid <laughs> some of our approaches are uh, to, to what we're doing. And so basically what happened was that uh, when the book came out, Nicholas Wade wrote a kind of a nice piece on it. And, and, and we ended up engaging in a conversation. And he was the one who said, well, you know, if you think that certain class of people had all the reproductive success in English society, couldn't you use people's surnames as a way of tracking that? And I was saying to him, well, no, I don't think so. Cause I think, you know, most British surnames don't vary that much in status, but that then, you know, when I later thought about it, I thought, hold on, this is an amazing kind of unexploited resource where we're all connected to a distant past. In England, most people had surnames before 1300. And we have this connection. We don't know the details of it, <laughs> but we do have this incredible connection over time. And maybe we can use that in order to estimate things like social mobility well into the medieval period in England, right? Because social mobility is very hard to estimate because you need to link parent and child. And, and that's very difficult, even in the census era. And so then we went happily ahead and saying, okay, this will be a nice idea. Let's try and do this. Uh, and then when we got the data, uh, amazingly, it showed this much stronger link than expected between generations. And it really was just a matter of, hold on, there's something going on here because I had no inkling that this would happen. In fact, I expected we should find somewhat weaker link because we're only probabilistically linking people across generations. And so uh, then it was just a matter of kind of sitting down and thinking, well, what could possibly explain what is actually happening here? And we ended up coming up with a, a kind of a model of social mobility, which says that there's something deeper that's transmitted from parent to child. But that gets transformed into your actual outcomes only with a large kind of random element. But that deeper thing is being transmitted very faithfully. Uh, but it's obscured in the ordinary course of events by these large kind of random elements. And it turns out that that model seems to work very, very successfully. So just to be clear, when, in when, we, when we track social mobility right now, what we do is we kind of look at the status of the parent status of the child, and then we calculate a correlation, right? Between right. the relative position of the parent and the relative position of the child. But we typically only do sure. that within one generation. And so what you're saying is that, you know, there's going to be a lot of noise and, and a lot of randomness. And so what we should be doing right. is, is like tracking the entire kind of, you know, lineage uh, at, which will smooth out a lot of that kind of random variation. That, that's right. That, that, that basically there's not, and, and this noise is of several sorts. One is that our measures of status are very imperfect, right? If I say completed four years of college, that could mean anything, right? In terms of what you actually learned from those four years of college, right? But that's a standard measure that people use. If we use occupational status, you know, it's incredibly loose. And so in some sense, this is just a, a product of the noise that's there. But the second thing is that there really are kind of random variations, right? That people of similar abilities can end up in very different positions by luck, by chance, by getting inspired, by, you know, getting sick. Um, and, and so that it's saying that, the, you know, there is a deeper process at work. And it turns out that the surnames will perfectly track that deeper process. And what they reveal is two things. One is that social mobility is almost universal across society. So that's the good news. If you're an elite now, in the long run, your descendants will be average. If you're at the bottom now, in the long run, again, you, you'll make it to the average. 
right? Your but it's not shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in, in three generations, like most people no, believe. No, that, <laughs> Maybe three, 300 the bad generations. News. The bad news is it's about 10 generations in, in British society. And then we can actually find some societies where it's slower. So in India, for example, it is slower because of caste and, and marriage only within caste by a lot of people. Uh, and, and so, so the, yes, so that, so then you discovered, uh, and, and here's which I've found intellectually interesting since then is when I've studied economic growth, the rise and fall of nations, all of these other things, what you're really struck by is our complete inability to predict anything in economics, right? I mean, we're not a science. <laughs> we don't know 10 years from now. Who's going to be in the ups and who's going to be in the down? I mean, remember back to the 1980s when we all thought that Japan was going to be the next great economic power in the world, right? We have no idea whether China will surpass the United States or will its trajectory look like Japan or Korea. Uh, and, and so, you know, we, we, we just have great difficulties predicting stuff. What's amazing about social mobility, when you look at it on, in these long perspectives, is how lawlike it is. I mean, these, these systems show just very great regularity. We can't predict it for individuals what their outcomes are going to be. But once we turn to groups of people, we can predict very well roughly where that group is going to be even 200 years from now or 300 years from now. Um, and the other thing that showed up in this data is that social institutions don't seem able to very significantly change these trajectories. And so a, a recent example, I did some work on Hungary, where it turns out that in Hungary, if your name ends in a Y, that was typically an aristocratic ending in the 19th century. And so Nicholas, is it Sarkozy, the French uh, prime minister, he's actually of Hungarian descent. And he has one of these elite names. And it's only two or 3% of the population that have these names. Uh, they're still overrepresented in the Hungarian parliament. They're still overrepresented in universities, in elite occupations. But you can track what happened to the Y names during communism in Hungary. And then after, then the social democratic regime afterwards, it had no effect on the social status of that group under communism. They were expelled from parliament, but other than that, they continued on their way and they've just been gradually regressing to the mean, <laughs> but in a process where even a hundred years from now, there's still going to be a kind of social elite. And, and so as I say, so the things that really came across were the slowness of social mobility and also it's kind of large scale imperviousness to things like the introduction of mass education, the introduction of welfare systems, uh, that, that to change this is, is actually very difficult in any society to change these rates of mobility. I found the China data particularly interesting because I mean, you can't imagine a more wholesale effort to kind of disrupt this continuity. Uh, I mean, cultural revolution. Right. I mean, you know, slaughtering a million landowners. I mean, what is, is there anything that you, that they could have done that they didn't do to try to, um, you know, eliminate this consistency and yet it's, it's still there. Right. I, oh, I know. Yes. I mean, unfortunately China only has about 4,000 surnames for 1.4 billion people. Uh, so it's not the best society to use surnames, but we could find some that were elite earlier and then track them through time up to the present. And they maybe, instead of a, you know, 0.7 correlation between generations, maybe they got down to 0.65 or 0.6. And so they might've done a little bit in terms of, of changing these rates of mobility, but essentially no. Uh, and later studies actually show that the leaders in current Chinese villages tend to be descended from the people who were the landlord class before the communist revolution, right? And, and it's quite common. I mean, the, the people can change their identity. They can change how they label themselves. Uh, so people know all about this, but it is amazing that people will just adapt to the social system 
and that there really is this amazing uh, persistence, right? Another feature, so, so in, the, in the latest stuff, you know, I, I've switched from actually using surnames to looking now at a lineage of 400,000 English people between 1700 and now, where we know all of their family connections. And so for a lot of people, we even know across eight generations. Legitimate ones though, right? You yes, don't, still right. don't have but, the... But most, uh, m m most births were, were legitimate in England up until uh, the early 20th century, at least. Uh, and so, so when you look at that, um, what is amazing is that you can actually observe these individual correlations, right? And so one of the things we can do in the data is look at how correlated are second cousins, third cousins, fourth cousins, fifth cousins, sixth cousins. These are people you never socially interact with. There's still significant correlations in outcomes uh, across. And, and these are people where you had a common ancestor 200 years ago, right? And have probably never interacted with these people since then. Uh, and then the other thing that's amazing that shows up in the data is it's very law-like that if we want, if I want to predict how a child will do, I can look at their parent, but I'll always get more information if I look at the grandparents, the uncles, the aunts, the great grandparents, right? And, and so you really are, everyone is embedded in this kind of wider structure where your outcomes are quite law-like and predictable from uh, these other influences. And we can even look at it by gender and say, is your maternal grandfather more or less important than your paternal? And the amazing answer there is for occupation or educational status, it's exactly equivalent, the amount of information they provide. But for wealth, it's the paternal grandfather that matters in England. Um, and one of the things I think you, you point out is that maybe social mobility was greater in medieval England than in, in, in modern England. Um, uh, is, 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 did you make that? I think you made that claim. I, it I, wasn't I, huge, but. I think what I would claim is, I think there's good evidence that social mobility rates were uh, not any lower in medieval England than later, right? And, and the nice piece of evidence we get from that is that, you know, when names were formed in medieval England, a lot of them relate to occupation. So you know, okay, that was what the occupation of this person was. So blacksmith is one, like Smith is the most common name. And in 1300, there's no one with a working class occupational name in Oxford or Cambridge. 200 years later, they're fully represented at these elite universities. And that's a very similar rate of social mobility to the one that we observe now in England. I mean, 200 years is a long time. It's a lot of generations, but it is amazing that you can literally see the rise of the Smiths, right? Uh, to positions of, of full kind of equality in, in the society. Um, and then at the same time, what's happening is the aristocrats are actually descending downwards and, and they're becoming average. They're not becoming, you know, uh, below average. Um, but yeah, uh, and, and I see what's amazing about that is in medieval England, there's no system of welfare. There's no system of public schooling. <laughs> there's no system of, you know, opportunity and access, uh, for people, but somehow under the kind of supervision of the medieval church, it really is a society that provides just as much opportunity as modern Britain does. And, uh, you also talk about the role of uh, endogamy in, in kind of maintaining, uh, or resisting this, uh, social mobility and, and kind of the regression to the mean. Right. So, so in so, some societies promote it and others, right. uh, right. you know, don't, don't promote it. Right. Well, that, that brings me, so, so the, the current book that I'm working on, uh, has the provisional title of, uh, for whom the bell curve tolls, uh, genetics and social mobility. And it really confronts this question of, you know, what is driving these social processes? And it's, I have the evidence already, so it's going to claim that the reason for this resistance of social mobility to social interventions is because it's mainly driven by genetic transmission, 
But the book also says that the, the reason that social mobility is so slow uh, is because it also turns out that there's a very important social institution here, which is that people are marrying people who have very, very similar characteristics to themselves. And this is what is actually then leading to people producing children who are close to clones of themselves. And uh, that, that is why, and, and, and that that's a very interesting institution because when we marry, there's no obvious reason. Why would we choose someone who has the same social capabilities as we have, right? Why wouldn't people choose instead, I want the prettiest possible partner, I want the youngest possible partner, I want the richest partner. But you do actually, and, and the data is very convincing that what people are choosing in marriage is someone who's very similar in terms of educational potential and kind of social capabilities. And so an extreme version of that is a society where a group would only marry endogamously. And if this, this project is correct, what should happen in such a society is that that endogamous group will not change its social status over time. It will actually maintain its status forever, right? Because what's actually causing social mobility is that you can't match up perfectly with people who have your characteristics. And if you're at the top of the distribution, the error is going to be typically on the downside in terms of, of the matching. Uh, and, and it turns out that we, we do observe some societies such as Egypt, where the Coptic population, which has no real political power, it is almost entirely endogamous. And it maintained its elite status in Egypt over the course of more than a thousand years. And as I say, we don't observe that in something like British society, right? And, and that, as I say, is consistent with an idea that this is, uh, that, that complete endogamy <laughs> will actually cause, uh, an absence of social mobility. And then, then secondly, we see in India that upper caste Indians, those castes were formed potentially a thousand years ago with normal rates of social mobility. The Brahmin should not be in any way special in India now, but again, you get this process of almost complete endogamy up until recently in these groups. Uh, and so, so there are lots of kind of implications of, uh, these, these different, uh, accounts, uh, of social mobility, but as I say, it, it, the claim in the book is going to be that modern society has very slow rates of social mobility because of a combination of a form of marriage, which is highly, uh, assortative genetically, right. In terms of people's capabilities, uh, plus a genetic transmission of a surprising set of characteristics, right. Uh, and, and that, that, you know, it, so it's this kind of interaction of social factors and kind of biological factors. But if it was pure assorted of mating, right, where the highest status mated with the highest status, then, you know, it'd be difficult to explain social change, right? Because, you know, it has to be more that like marries like, and, and, and then, um, because if, 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 if it was simply status matching rather than kind of homophily, then the things that led to high status would presumably be frozen in time. And, and, uh, you know, we, we would still be marrying the, you know, the warriors and, and not the, the, the shopkeepers. Right. Uh, well, it seems, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to get it. Look, let me back up a second. One problem we face in looking at assortment in marriage before say the 1920s is that upper class women don't have any occupation in Britain. And so how do you tell what exactly is the assortment that's going on in marriage? But there is convincing evidence from Britain that it's not that you're marrying the family and it's not that you're marrying the father, <laughs> that you're actually matching up with the characteristics of your bride. And these are characteristics that are about, you know, 
if I meet this person, do they strike me as being similar in terms of interests and capabilities and aspirations? And that that type of marriage seems to be very significant in Britain. Uh, and as I say, it's leading to this kind of pairing of people of very similar social backgrounds and abilities. But, but the other thing that's important in British society is that it's an open society, right? So that when the Jewish population came there, they were actually, uh, many of them assimilated and became upper-class British. <laughs> uh, but they actually found relatively easy acceptance. And, and so that there is this possibility then of new groups of social change, uh, even though, as I say, there is this high degree of assortment in terms of the characteristics that people are looking for uh, in a partner. Um, but as I say, there's, there's a lot of work still to do in terms of kind of to, to tease out, you know, wh what is happening there. But, but to, to jump back to what I was saying earlier, one thing that's particularly interesting about this marriage pattern is that the data for England suggests that people are marrying genetically people who are closer than their first cousin. Right? And there are some, there are some societies uh, where people do marry their first cousin, but typically you don't have much choice. You don't have many first cousins of the right age. And so then you marry that person, and then we can actually calculate what would be the typical uh, correlation in underlying genetics. The data for England suggests that the correlation is even closer through choice and assortment. Um, one of the things that that will do in any society, if it was to switch to such a marriage pattern, is it will actually increase the variance of abilities across the society. And so the other kind of interesting, intriguing possibility now is, could another factor in the arrival of the Industrial Revolution and of the modern world be that somehow a set of societies decided that's how we should form marriages, right? We shouldn't do it based on dynasty or cousin or something like that. We should actually form marriages based on individual characteristics. And what's interesting about marriage in Europe is that women don't get married typically till about age 24 or 26. And so women have a lot of independence of their family before they make these marriage decisions. And they have a lot of time to experience the world. And so it's also this intriguing possibility that by adopting this type of marriage pattern, you're making it easier to, to match up then with someone who shares your characteristics and that this would have this social effect of widening the distribution of abilities. But the other thing that's interesting is that if you adopt that pattern, it would take 400 or 500 years for that to play out across the generations in terms of that uh, distribution. And so it could say maybe it was a switch in the medieval periods to new patterns of marriage in Europe that ended up producing a society which had more people at the kind of upper tail of abilities in terms of entrepreneurship and uh, educational potential, things like that. And that that's actually another kind of interesting component of this kind of development of a world where uh, uh, change uh, became faster. And in, in pursuit of this, I've actually been trying to look about question about, well, how do people decide who to mate with in hunter-gatherer society, right? I mean, what, what are the rules? I, and unfortunately, so far, I haven't been able to find very much about what is the nature of assortment uh, in earlier societies. Well, you looked at, I think you, uh, you, you, you cited is, uh, Napoleon Chagnon's work. Uh, yeah. So I should, I should look there and see. I, I, I mean, I know his work on reproductive success as a function of violence. Um, but, but I'd say it's, it's a, and so I'd say, so uh, this is the third book uh, in this kind of trilogy. And so the interesting thing is that it seems to be leading back to some of the questions that, that started off this thing where it, it could turn out that there's actually this intimate connection between the possibilities of economic growth and the social institutions again. But in this case, it's actually the social institution of uh, marriage. Um, and 
I have a student who's just finished his dissertation here, and he's been looking at kind of some similar issues about marriage in Quebec. Quebec has fantastic uh, genealogical sources, and almost the entire history of the, the French origin population in Quebec has actually been mapped all the way back to before 1600. And he finds kind of very similar pattern in Quebec that there's very tight assortment in marriage and he can actually show convincingly there that the assortment is driven by the characteristics of the people getting married, not by their families. And so if you have two sisters and one is able to write and the other one is not, the sister who can write gets a husband who's more literate typically than the system who does, doesn't. And so as you see, there, there is this kind of fascinating question then about the role of marriage and of these institutions in terms of the structure of the society, but, but also by the way, with this, with this downside that the more assortment there is in marriage, the slower will rates of social mobility be, and the more inequality there'll be in a society. <laughs> So we, we all want, I think for people who want to increase social mobility, um, you know, the pessimistic message in the book is that, you know, there's no, you know, shock, there's no, uh, kind of instantaneous fix. Um, you know, if you were to take people who are, you know, poor and, and just give them all big chunks of money, right. It wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily do anything. Um, but if you could somehow figure out a way to encourage exogamy, then that, that could potentially accelerate, uh, social mobility. So, you know, when you read the New York times, uh, marriage section, some people call it the mergers and acquisition, uh, section, right. You know, <laughs> you look at all these people who went to similar institutions and universities with similar jobs, you know, maybe, um, uh, you know, the, the, the government could get into the, you know, dating business by encouraging the, the, the mixing of, of different, uh, status groups in places like universities now. Yeah, well, an interesting feature has been that a lot of people have been expecting that assortment in marriage was going to get much stronger once women acquired formal education, and that that actually would produce a world of less social mobility. So someone like Charles Murray, for example, has harped on about this as kind of uh, an in interesting possibility. The data that we have for England suggests actually quite strongly that there hasn't been any increase in assortment in marriage, right? That that dystopia <laughs> is, is not coming. And in fact, we just don't have enough data to be conclusive on this. There seems some evidence it may be actually declining assortment in marriage and that people were able to assort incredibly well before women had formal education. And we can see it all the way back till 1800 that this assortment is very strong. And so at least in that aspect, the, the, the data suggests that there's, there's potentially slightly less, uh, assortment. Um, and as I say, in, if the book is correct in this description of the mechanisms of persistence, any decline in assortment will lead to uh, greater, uh, rates of social mobility. Uh, but I'm not sure how you, again, socially engineer, uh, people, uh, to have less assortment in, in marriage. I mean, if other social policies have failed, then a, a government marriage bureau <laughs> that says, have you considered <laughs> a less prestigious partner <laughs> as your contribution, uh, to social mobility? I, I don't think that's, uh, that's going to work, uh, particularly well. Well, I think in, in the new book, you probably dig into this deeper because I think people in, in the world of biology would, I'd say that these heritable traits that you're pointing out could very well be transmitted, you know, through culture and through, through upbringing. Right. Uh, and, uh, they would say that evolution doesn't work that fast. It doesn't work as fast as, as you're suggesting. Um, and it seems like the evidence we have from immigration would seem to support that idea, right? Where someone can go from being low status in, in one country to, you know, their descendants being of relatively high status the minute they move from one country well, to the I, next. I, I, I actually have to say, I don't, it's absolutely the case that through immigration, people can change their absolute living standard 
and absolute levels of education, I don't know that the evidence is good that people can change their relative position within the society. And in particular, this database we have now of these English families, a substantial number end up emigrating to Australia, New Zealand, Canada, United States. And the evidence from that immigration is that it doesn't change their occupational status very much. That, that you can compare grandchildren who stayed in Britain versus the grandchildren who ended up in the United States, and they look uh, pretty similar. And so, so the evidence there is actually that it doesn't, it, you know, and they may be much richer, the ones in the United States, in terms of uh, wage levels, earnings, uh, capital. Um, but it's not clear that emigration changes people's relative uh, position very much. Uh, and, and, um, and as I say, that's, uh, you know, if, if you, if you now look in the United States, the, the highest status substantial social group are Indian Americans from the Indian subcontinent, but they are very much a selected elite from within Indian society, right? It's not that the, the, the Dalit groups in India are being now made into Silicon Valley, you know, hyper, super well-paid engineers. It's Brahmins from India who are moving to America and, and succeeding uh, very well. And so, um, yeah, and, and so I'm, I'm afraid the, the book, uh, as I say, it does have this comfort that in the long run, there's a profound equality for everyone, but it does have this downside that says that that long run is 300 years in the future. Well, I certainly look forward to the, uh, the next, uh, volume in this, in this trilogy, in this series. Uh, but while we're all waiting for that next book, um, about the, uh, uh, the bell curve, what was it? For whom the the bell curve tolls, tolls right? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if, while we're waiting, we can uh, everyone should check out a farewell to alms, which is you know one of the most interesting books about the industrial revolution and surnames and the history of social mobility. The sun also rises. Thanks so much, Greg. Appreciate you joining me. Oh sure, no, this was great fun. Thank you very much for having me on. Yeah. This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.